looking at the book of Leviticus, and you might be asking yourself, why does this even apply to me? It's almost like the first 20 minutes of a movie and you're thinking like, who is this? Why do I care about this? Why is this important? And then in the, in the next half of the movie, you're like, ah, this makes sense now. Um, all, all stories and all movies have a moment like that. Talk to your group about your favorite movie and we'll be back in a second. So Bethany asked you guys what your favorite movie is, and I'd love to hear. Next time you talk, talk to me, I'd love to hear what your favorite movie is. I was never really a big movie person growing up. My little brother is still the kind of person who can watch the same movie over and over and over again. But ironically, my favorite class in all of high school was film studies. Now part of that is obviously because I was watching movies instead of doing math. But another part of it is how deeply it changed the way that I watch movies, that you get to see uh, through the eyes of a, a director, you know, what are they trying to accomplish here? And you get to see plot lines and character development and you get to learn fancy words like denouement and typology and you seem super fancy when you watch movies. Now one of the most powerful tools that script writers and book writers will use is called foreshadowing. Where they, they point ahead or they give hints of something that is to come that's greater than what you see in the moment. Now, as we open up to the book of Leviticus, chapter 16, what we're going to see is foreshadowing. We're going to walk through the Day of Atonement, which is this, this picture that God gives us of the sacrifices needed for him to stay with the people of Israel in their camp. So you might be asking a couple of questions here. Uh, first of all, what is atonement? So the Day of Atonement is this special day where the high priest comes and makes sacrifices for the people of Israel so that God can stay in their camp with them. Again, you might have a couple of questions. First, what is atonement? Atonement literally means to cover over. So on the Day of Atonement, this high priest makes the sacrifices that will cover over the sins of God's people so that he can forgive them and continue to interact with them and live amongst them. You might also ask, what's a high priest? We don't have high priests anymore, but this was a, a man specially selected by God to represent God to God's people and God's people to God. He's what they would call a mediator or the go-between between God and his people. Now, the, it acts a little bit like the Pope in the Catholic Church today. Not a perfect example, but kind of where you get. Now, the high priest has this job. He's this special representative for God, and he has all sorts of things that show that. Specifically, his outfit. He is decked out head to toe in all these special uh, garments. He's got gold and special flowing robes, and all these things are meant to show just how special he is and the job that he has is, and, and the role of God in his people. So he's chosen by God to work through this Day of Atonement. And that's where we find ourselves. The book of Leviticus, chapter 16. And here's, we read together. The Lord said to Moses, warn your brother Aaron not to enter the most holy place behind the inner curtain whenever he chooses. If he does, he will die. For the ark's cover, the place of atonement is there. And I myself am present in the cloud above the atonement cover. So Brittany explained to you guys a little bit last week of this most holy place, the innermost part of the temple. There's the outer inner court and then the holy place and then the most holy place. It's this incredibly special place behind a curtain where the literal presence of God lived on the mercy seat or the place of atonement. And God was there, but he needed to be separated from his people. We talked last time I was with you guys about this divide that needed to happen between God and his people. And there was only one person who could go into the most holy place. That's Aaron, the high priest. And he can't just waltz in there whenever he wants. He can only go in there once a year on this, the Day of Atonement. And this would happen, God's people, all of them would gather together and watch what would unfold on this special day. Now imagine being Aaron in this moment. 
you have this unbelievable role to go and stand before God on behalf of his people. You have to bring sacrifices and the whole, everyone's gathered around watching you do this. And if you do everything just right, you won't die. But if you don't, you might. It's a really serious responsibility that he's probably feeling a lot of weight in that moment. Have you ever experienced a pressure like this? Have you ever felt like you're responsible for somebody else's well-being? Maybe it was when you were learning to babysit or maybe it's a project at school or at work where you have to represent some other people. Maybe in athletics, you're representing your school or maybe you're off uh, on your own and you're representing your family. There's a lot of ways that we can feel that pressure. I'd love for you guys to take just a couple of moments and chat in your group and ask, have you ever felt responsible for other people and what was that like for you? With all of this pressure bearing down on him, the people watch as the high priest, Aaron, has this whole lineup of sacrifices to perform. God lays out in uh, this chapter, this rhythm and order of sacrifices that need to be made. But before Aaron, the high priest, can get started on doing this, he actually has to make sacrifices for himself. While the high priest has this incredible role and he's got all these things to show the world outside that he has this incredible role, he's just a man. And because he is just a human who is sinful and has made mistakes, he's got to make these sacrifices in order to be able to come into God's presence. So let's read from Leviticus 6, 3 and 4. When Aaron enters into the sanctuary area, he must follow these instructions fully. He must bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Then he must put on his linen, linen tunic and his linen undergarments worn next to his body. I just think it's awesome that the Bible talks about his underwear. Then he must tie a linen sash around his waist, put the linen turban on his head. These are sacred garments, so he must bathe himself in water before he puts them on. So today, on this special day, Aaron, the high priest who normally has all of these fancy clothes decked out in gold that show the world, the people of Israel, the people of God, who he is in the special role that he is. Before he comes on this day of atonement, he has to take all of those things off and lay them aside and put on this very ordinary, very plain linen garment. This would have been an incredibly humbling experience for Aaron. It would have been a real reminder for him that regardless of the role that God has given him, He's still a sinful man and he needs a sacrifice for himself as well. We continue reading in Leviticus 16, 6. Aaron will present his own bull as a sin offering to purify himself and his family, making them right with the Lord. He needs this. Aaron needs to be able to do this, to come before God and to not die and he, as he does that. Because what comes next is he gets this incredible, terrifying experience of stepping into the Lord's presence. This is a reminder of how real the situation is. You are the only person alive who's able to step into the presence of God. And you need to make sure that your sins are covered so that when you step past that curtain, you don't die. It's an incredible privilege, but one you can't take lightly. Actually, Aaron has lost two sons who they didn't even go into the most holy place. They went into the holy place and didn't take their job seriously and ended up dying because of it. Aaron understands the incredible privilege and responsibility that he's faced, faced with here. Approaching God for Aaron and for us is no joke. It can be incredibly intimidating, and it's something that needs to be taken seriously. So I wonder for you, how do you feel about approaching God? Do you only approach God when it's an SOS situation? You've, you've got a test coming up or a world, your world has fallen apart and you just call out to God? Maybe when you approach God, you do it, but you're really scared and you worry if your sins are going to disqualify you from getting a hearing. Maybe you're just super casual and you're like, hey, Jesus is my homeboy, and you don't really take it that seriously. Or maybe you don't even approach God at all. 
Again, I'd love for you guys to take a couple of minutes and chat about that in your D group. Aaron's done getting himself ready, preparing himself for this, but there's still so much to be done for the people of God. He has to do this all for the nation of Israel, and it's this series of sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice. The high priest is basically half pastor, half butcher, because he has to perform all of these animal sacrifices. And then there's this strange part in the list of sacrifices. Many of these are really normal things that would have happened day after day in the tabernacle, and the high priest would have been used to them. But there's these two goats that show up. Let's read about them. Then he, the high priest, must take two male goats and present them to the Lord at the entrance of the tabernacle. He is to cast sacred lots to determine which goat will be reserved as an offering to the Lord and which will be the one that carries the sins of the people into the wilderness of Azazel. Aaron will present the sin offering, the goat chosen by the lot for the Lord. The other goat will be the scapegoat chosen by lot to be sent away. He will be kept alive, standing before the Lord. When it is sent away to Azazel in the wilderness, the people will be purified and made right with the Lord. These two goats may seem weird, but they represent something powerful. They represent how God deals with our sin. Last time I taught you guys, we talked about the consequences of sin, and there was two that we talked about. We said the wages of sin is death. What we earn for ourselves what needs to be atoned for, why there needs to be blood to cover our sins is because the wages of sin is death. It's a death that we deserve. And watching these animals lose their lives for our sake would be a humbling reminder of what it takes to come into God's presence. But there's the second goat here, right? And remember what we said the other consequence was. There's a distance created when we sin. And the people would watch as Aaron placed his hands on the hand of this goat and openly confessed their sin to God and placed it on the head of this goat. And then the consequence of this goat carrying their sin was that he couldn't be there anymore and he needed to carry the sins away. Just like in Adam and Eve were cast out of the Garden of Eden, he, this goat had to be sent away into the wilderness, away from where God's presence was this would be an incredibly harsh reminder of the seriousness of sin and what's required for them to be able to have God amongst them. And here's what makes this day so important. Through all these sacrifices, many of these things would have happened. The difference is on this day of atonement, where the sins of all of God's people are covered over, is that we move not just into the holy place, but into the most holy place. The blood that would normally be splattered on the altar of God, Aaron carries behind the curtain and puts on the mercy seat, pleading for atonement. The incense that would normally burn in the holy place goes right before God into his presence and rises right to God's very presence as a representation of the prayers of God's people. God was making a way to be with his people. This is good news for sinful people. Isn't it incredible that God wanted to be with his people? After all we've talked about for the past few weeks, even though it was all this work and all of these things, even though they didn't deserve it, God still wanted to be with his people. And that is still true today. And I wonder if you have ever experienced that, experienced the presence of God in your life. Have you heard from him? Have you felt his presence? Do you know what it's like to hear from and experience the presence of God. Whether you have or not, I'd love for you guys to take a couple minutes here and chat about that in your group. Now the strange truth after all these reminders was that there was still this divide between God and his people. Even though God was making a way, it wasn't a perfect way yet. This curtain that could only be crossed once a year by one man, that means the rest of Israel would spend their entire lives knowing that God was near, but not being able to walk into his presence. 
I hope you're beginning to see the foreshadowing at this point. This picture of a high priest, the one man who could come into God's presence and cover over the sins of God's people, wasn't enough. This day of atonement had to happen year after year after year. These sacrifices needed to be made over and over again. And as we enter into this Easter season, I hope that you can see that Jesus is the high priest that we really need. He's the one that would not just lay down some fancy outfit that showed the world how important he was. He laid down the glory of being God in heaven, set that aside, and didn't just put on a linen robe, he put on the fact that he was human. He took on humanity. The God of the universe came to us so that we could come near to him. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 9:11. So Christ has now become the high priest over all good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in heaven, which was made not by human hands and is not a part of this world. We have a perfect high priest who comes before us and intercedes and, and takes the, the place of us and, and talks to God on our behalf and makes this sacrifice on our behalf. He covers it all because he's not only the high priest, Jesus is also the perfect sacrifice. Those animals could never cover over our sins. They cover over it temporarily, but it needs to be done again and again and again. But Jesus is the full and sufficient sacrifice for our sins. The next verse in Hebrew says, with his own blood, not the blood of goats and cows, he entered into the most holy place once and for all time and secured our redemption forever. This whole book of Hebrews shows the incredible ways that Jesus is the fulfillment of the foreshadowing of the Old Testament. Again and again, these things were, were true things that God was using to keep his people close to him, but they were never going to be enough on their own. Only Jesus, only God himself, laying aside the glory of heaven and stepping into humanity would be enough so that we could walk boldly into God's presence. When Jesus died on the cross, when he made the full and sufficient sacrifice for our sins, the veil that divided the holy place and the most holy place was torn in two. That divide between God and his people was gone. It was done with. And the Bible tells us that you and I, we, our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't want to just be with us. He wants to live in us. He puts his spirit within us and speaks to us and uses us and works through us. What an incredible God we serve. On the Day of Atonement, when, when God's people walked through this, they were called to humble themselves. They actually repeat this in verse 29 and 31. They say it twice, that you must humble yourself. And I think that would actually be pretty easy to do. As you stare at the sacrifices and the separation and all that it took to keep God with you, how could you not? My hope for each one of you, whether this conversation on Jesus and high priests and all that stuff is new to you, or whether you've grown up and this has been a long time thing for you, my hope is that your heart would be humbled, that you have a God who loves you so much that he would let nothing stop him, cover over your sin with his own blood to make a way that he could be with you. And if you're scared, don't let your sin divide in a way that Jesus has already taken care of. Instead, humble yourself before him. Come to him, confess your sins, and find the love and forgiveness that is already yours in the full work that's already complete done by our perfect, great high priest and perfect sacrifice, Jesus. Let's come to him in prayer. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the perfect fulfillment of the foreshadowing. God, thank you that all along the way, you were giving us those breadcrumbs, that foreshadowing that you would not leave us in our sin, but you would come. You would make a way for us 
that we could never do on our own so that we could be together with you. I pray for those who know that already. God, would you let that truth sink deep into their hearts? For those who feel distant from you right now, even though they've known that at some point, God, would you call them back and remind them of the goodness and the fullness that you have already given them? And for those who just are new to this, this whole Jesus thing doesn't make sense yet. God, would you continue to to point out ways that you are all that they need, the all-sufficient sacrifice that you, Lord Jesus, are enough. God, we thank you and we love you and we're humbled. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. See you guys. Wow, guys, what a powerful reminder of how God wants to be with us and not just near us. I hope you guys are reminded of how awesome God's plan is and how much he loves you and how his love can grow inside of you to even bring back more love to him. Have a happy Easter, guys, and see you soon.